We've got two types of curved mirrors, and today that's what we're going to focus on, the analysis of those curved mirrors. The first kind is what we call a converging mirror, also known as a concave mirror. Now, we call it a converging mirror because rays converge. Rays of light that are coming off of whatever our object is hit the mirror, and then they converge. They come together. We also call it a concave mirror because if we look at it from the side, kind of a side view like you see here, it's caved in. It's thinner in the middle than it is at the edges. So both names come from the fact that it's caved in and the fact that rays of light converge or come together. Converging concave mirror. You see a photograph of somebody standing in front of these, one of these big concave mirrors. They see themselves in that mirror as a giant. Right? The face is massive. It's right side up. We don't know right now whether it's real or virtual. Okay? We don't know whether it could be projected onto a screen or not. We just know that it's that uh, we're physically looking into the mirror in order to see this, see this image. The other type of mirror that we have is a diverging mirror or a convex mirror. A diverging mirror is exactly the opposite. Instead of being caved in in the middle or thinner in the middle than it is at the edges, if you look at it from the side, then it's thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. It's convex. We also call it diverging because if rays of light hit the mirror, they don't come together down here. Rather, they diverge away from each other like this. Converging, diverging. Concave, convex. The photograph you see of the diverging mirror here, or the convex mirror, is the kind of mirror that you might see uh, at a swimming pool, in Okotoks, for instance, at the hot tub. How many of you guys have, uh, have seen, have gone into the hot tub in the, uh, the rec center in Okotoks? There's a a convex mirror up in the corner of it. Uh, the reason they have that, I guess, is that uh, there's, there's, there's kind of a wheelchair ramp that goes down into that, and then there's a little wall, a little half wall that uh, basically has a rail on it for somebody in a wheelchair so that they can get into that. The problem is when the lifeguards are standing on the other side of the hot tub, if there happens to be a little kid on that ramp sitting down, the lifeguard can't see them. When you have a convex mirror up in the corner, then you can see around that corner and you can see behind that wall. Okay? The problem is, you can see the image there. The person's right side up in that image, but quite a bit smaller, right? Versus the first scenario where they were right side up, but quite a bit bigger. Today we're going to draw ray diagrams for both of these types of mirrors for five different scenarios or five different ranges in each of these types of mirrors. The other day we do a ray diagram for a plain flat mirror, the mirror that you see in the bathroom every morning when you look into the mirror we saw that the characteristics of that image was always right side up, always the same size, and it was always going to be a virtual image. Okay, we look into the mirror, okay, we have to physically look into the mirror in order to see it. Today we're going to find all kinds of different possible outcomes, depending upon what kind of mirror we have, but also where the object is in relation to the mirror itself. The handout that you just got has two different types of mirror, a template for two different types of mirror, one on each side. The first side is the concave mirror, or the converging mirror. Five different diagrams for converging mirrors, and then on the back side we have five different diagrams for diverging, or convex mirrors. I want to point out a couple of things about the first diagram, and most of those things will carry on through all five of those diagrams on the first side of the page. First thing that I want to point out is this imaginary line that we have drawn that is perpendicular to the mirror itself, and goes through the center of the mirror. We call that the principal axis. It's an imaginary line, but we need to draw it so that we can draw our rays of light that come off of this object. So that principal axis is the line that's perpendicular to the mirror, and it goes through the middle, the center of that mirror. Now, you can see a, a dot immediately to the left of the concave mirror. That first dot is labeled F, the focal point of the mirror. That focal point is the point for which all rays of light that are parallel to the principal axis converge. If I draw a ray of light coming in here, it's not going to converge at the focal point because it's not parallel to the principal axis. But if I draw a ray of light right here, it will go through the focal point. If I draw another ray of light right here, it will go through the focal point. And another one right here, it will go through the focal point. 
So all rays that are parallel to the principal axis will go through the focal point. If, it doesn't, if it's not parallel to the principal axis, all bets are off in terms of where it goes. We can predict where it goes, but it's a lot harder to predict. You would have to look at the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection and so on. So we draw that line, we draw that focal point at the point where which, for which all rays parallel to the principal axis will converge or go through. Now the center of curvature looks to be about twice the distance from the linear as the focal point is. It is. It's exactly twice. In fact, sometimes we even say C, the center of curvature, is 2F, twice the focal length. What is the center of curvature? What's the significance of it? Well, if we were to extend this and make a complete circle like this, that's not really a circle, but get the idea. If we were to make a complete circle, then the center of curvature C would be in the geometric center of that circle, twice the focal length and at the exact center of that circle. Those are two significant points. Those are two very important spacers. When we have an object beyond the center of curvature, we get certain characteristics. When we have an object at the center of curvature, we get different characteristics. Between F and C, different characteristics, and so on. So every time the object goes from one zone to another, and the zones are defined by the center of curvature and the focal point, then we get different characteristics of the image. There are three rays that we can draw, three rays of light that we can draw and easily predict what will happen to them. We only ever really need to draw two, but on this first diagram, I'm going to draw all three just to show you what those three rays are. The first ray of light that we're going to draw is the ray of light that is reflecting off of the top of the object. We know that an object will reflect millions of rays of light. If I'm the object, then I'm going to reflect from the sun, from the lights on the ceiling, millions of rays of light in every which direction. But I want to pay attention to just three of them. Again, because those threes are very predictable. We can predict easily what's going to happen to them. The first one that I want to use is the one that reflects off of the top of the object parallel to the principal axis. I know that there's rays that go in crazy directions off of the top of the object. Why am I picking this one? Because this one's easy. Where is this one going to go? Through the focal point. I could have drawn a thousand other ones, but it's a lot harder to predict what happens to the other thousand. This one's easy. All rays parallel to the principal axis go to the focal point. Now, the next ray, the second ray that I'm going to draw, is going to be from the top of the object down through the focal point. I picked that one because it's convenient as well. I can predict easily what's going to happen to that one. Where's it going to go? Well, physics is a very symmetrical discipline. If we have a ray that goes parallel to the principal axis, then through the focal point, then we have a ray that goes through the focal point, where do you think it's going to go? Parallel to the principal axis. So let's draw that through here. Now, strictly speaking, that's enough. We don't need the third ray here. I'm just going to draw it just because I can, and you need to know what that third ray is. The third ray goes from the top of the object down through the center of curvature. Hits the mirror. Let's pretend it hits the mirror at least. I just haven't drawn my mirror big enough. It's going to reflect back upon itself and go in the exact opposite direction from which it came. There is a point here at which all three of these rays intersect. It's right here. Those rays that intersect came from the top of the object. So what am I going to see at that point? The top of the top of the image, right? Not the top of the object, the top of the image. If this is my head right here, then this is my head right here. But the bottom of that object was right here, 
on the principal axis, it remains on the principal axis. So the image ends up being formed like this. If the object is drawn from the principal axis to some point up above, then the image will be drawn from the principal axis to some point down below, the point at which the rays intersect. Hey, by the way, why aren't these rays all intersecting at the focal point? Because they're not all parallel to the principal axis. So the third ray, again, from the object, from the top of the object through the center of curvature, and it reflects back upon itself or back along the same path. There are three characteristics that we identify, just like we did with the plain flat mirror. We can look at the image and say it's larger, it's smaller, or same size. Let's look at the image here and compare it to the size of the object. You look into the mirror, this is you. You look into the mirror and see this. The image that you see in the mirror, is it bigger or is it smaller or is it the same size as the object is, as you are? Smaller. Yeah, it's smaller, for sure. Okay, if you're not sure about that, then measure it. Physically measure it. Okay, if you measure it, you can see that the image is going to be smaller than the object. Let's look at the second characteristic. The second characteristic is based on orientation, whether it's right side up or upside down. We're going to say upright or inverted. If we look at this image relative to the object, is it right side up or upside down? It's upside down. We know that because it's got to be measured from the principal axis. And because the point at which the, the rays of light reflecting off of my head converge below the principal axis, then the image of me in this mirror has to be upside down or inverted. The third one, real or virtual? We talked about this, I believe, on Friday, the difference between a real image in a virtual image. A real image is an image that can be projected onto a screen. A virtual image is an image that can't be projected onto a screen. Just because you have a real image doesn't mean that it is being projected onto a screen. A ray diagram can produce a real image, but yet we don't actually have one physically projected onto a screen. If I take my glasses off and do a ray diagram for the rays of light going through the convex lens in my eyes, it would produce a real image. Okay, the rays would converge and produce a real image. The problem is, the image would be produced in front of my retina. Sorry, uh, yeah, in front of my retina. And that's why I can't see them very well. Because the image that's actually projected onto my retina isn't really a focused image. It's not a sharp focused image. There isn't a good, clear image on my retina. But we still call it a real image because optically it's possible to produce a real image on my retina. It's just that my retina is not in the right place to see that focused image. Okay? That's, not, you know, that's not the fault of the optics. Okay? That's the fault of the biology. A real image can be projected onto a screen, or we can physically look into the mirror in order to see it mirror or lens in order to see it. A virtual image can't, can't be projected onto the screen no matter what. All right, so how do we know if we have a real image or a virtual image? The ray diagram that we drew last week for the plain flat bathroom mirror produced a virtual image. You couldn't project that image onto a screen. We knew it was a virtual image because dotted lines intersected. That told us that you couldn't project it onto a screen. Here, we have solid lines intersecting, right? Solid lines all intersecting. That tells me that we have a real image. That tells me that I could literally take a piece of paper, put a piece of paper right there, and see on that piece of paper an image of myself projected onto it. Now, what would happen... What would happen if I put move that piece of paper? I put it right here, or I put it right here. What would you see on that paper? 
you'd see maybe kind of a little bit of an outline of a person, but it wouldn't be a focused image. We still call it a real image, even though it's not a good image being projected onto the screen, but we call it a real image because if I put that piece of paper in the right place, I could see a sharp focused image on that screen. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's exactly the same thing. What you're doing there, uh, Chase, what you're doing there is actually changing uh, the object distance there. So you're, you're changing the object distance kind of inside there. We can do that with, with that projector as well, absolutely. Um, what it is more so, though, is as opposed to the adjustment. I know when I used to have one of those portable projectors, sometimes you just do a little adjustment, but sometimes you'd actually pull it back or push it forward to get a little bit of focus. Okay? That's, that's exactly this, right? Okay, that's exactly putting your, look, we got a real image produced, regardless, any way you look at it. We can make a real image out of it. We just have to have the screen in the right place in order to get the sharp focused image there. Okay, does that make sense? So it's smaller, it's inverted, and it's real. Now, you can see that we have three, ra three rays drawn here. All three of them coming off the top of my head, if I'm the object. If we got rid of that third ray, what would you tell me about the characteristics of this image? Smaller, it's inverted, it's real. Did we need to draw the third ray? No, you only ever need to draw two. If two rays intersect, that's enough to tell me where the image is. Again, I do that third ray because there's going to be a couple diagrams for which you have to draw the third ray. I just wanted to introduce it to you right now. For this one, we didn't need to. We could, and it works, and it doesn't change our results, but we didn't need to draw it because the first two rays were good enough to tell me where the image was. All right, let's draw the second one. The second one is that next phase or that next zone, we'll call it. The second one is when we have our object placed at the center of curvature. Now, hold on before you draw this one, okay? It's hard to make this one work perfectly. Sometimes you got to kind of fudge it a little bit. If you're not absolutely perfect with your lines, right through the center of this and the center of that, and if the mirror's not drawn perfectly on your page, and I'm not professing to have drawn it absolutely perfectly on your page with Microsoft Word, okay, then the image that you see is slightly off. Okay, this one is so finicky. Just watch what I do, and I'll show you what you're supposed to get, and then you can kind of fudge it a little bit if you have to on your page to make it look like that. The first ray, from the top of the object, it's going to go down through the focal point. The second ray is going to go down through the focal point, and then it's going to go parallel to the principal axis. That almost worked out the way it was supposed to. Those two rays, by the way, do we need to draw the third ray? No, we got two rays converging here. Those two rays should converge directly below the object, exactly below the object, right at the center of curvature. And the characteristics that we should see here, there are that is the same size. The image is not bigger or smaller than the object is. It's inverted. And it is real or virtual? Real. Solid lines are intersecting. That means that if we put a piece of paper right there where we see the real image produced, we could see a good, clear, sharp image of that object. Now, again, we could, doesn't mean we have to have a screen there. Okay, we don't have to project it onto the screen. We can look into the mirror and see it. But we could project it onto the screen if we wanted to. Our next diagram is produced when we have our object, which could be you or it could be some other inanimate object, it's placed between the focal length and the center of curvature. So we're getting a little closer now. We're in zone three, sometimes we call it. First zone is when the object is way out here. Second zone 
when it's at the center of curvature, third zone here now, when it's between F and C, the focal point and the center of curvature. First ray, top of the object, parallel to the principal axis, down to the focal point. Second ray, down to the focal point. Hits the mirror, well, at least we'll pretend that it hits the mirror there. Reflex, parallel to the principal axis. What do you see there? And there's an image that's produced right there. What do you know about that image? Larger, smaller, same size. Chase, is this image, is this red line bigger or smaller than the object, the green line? Larger. So we're going to say the image is larger. If you look into this mirror when you're standing at that position between F and C, you would see yourself in that mirror. But you'd see yourself upside down and bigger than you really are. You'd be magnified. We're going to say it's inverted as well. Real or virtual? Well, solid lines intersect. That means it is real, which of course means that it could be projected onto a screen if we wanted to. Next one. This one's going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky, so pay attention to this one before you start drawing it. The first ray from the top of the object that is at the focal point is going to go parallel to the principal axis again. And when it hits the mirror, it's going to reflect parallel to the, sorry, down through the focal point, just like that. Now, the second ray we normally draw from the top of the object through the focal point. We're not going to draw that one this time. This time, we're going to draw it from the top of the object as if it's going away from the center of curvature. It hits the mirror, and it reflects, well, it's pretended it hits the mirror, at least. It reflects back upon itself down through the center of curvature. What do you notice about these two rays? They're parallel to each other. They don't converge. So let's extend them. Let's extend the reflected ray back this way and the reflected ray back this way. These rays don't converge either. What does it tell you about this image? They're, it's not just not real. A virtual image is an image that we actually have. A real image doesn't mean that it's the only kind of image that we can actually see. It's just the only kind of image that we can project onto a screen. They're both virtual and real images, both actual images. Here, we don't have an image. The rays don't converge, so there is no image. If, and of course, there's no characteristics that go along with that. If you ever find, found yourself in a situation where you were you know, at the center of curvature, looking into a mirror, it's a funhouse mirror or something like that, you would see yourself in that mirror upside down, and you would see yourself the same size. Walk a little closer. You would see yourself in that mirror upside down, but bigger. Walk a little closer. You would disappear. If you stand right at the focal point, you could be standing there looking right at that mirror. You see nothing. You're not there. Now, it doesn't mean light's not reflecting off of the mirror. It is. It just means that there's not going to be an image formed. Okay, if you had a flashlight as your object, there would still be light reflecting off of the mirror, but you wouldn't see an image of the flashlight, whether it be projected onto a piece of paper or looking into the mirror or whatever. Let's draw the fifth and final zone, or the fifth and final scenario, for a concave or converging mirror. This time we have our object placed inside the focal length. Now remember that picture that we saw at the very beginning of this lesson today? There was a guy standing in front of a concave mirror. He saw an image of himself much, much bigger and right side up. We have a concave mirror here. We've gone through four of the five possible zones, and we have yet to see a situation where we see the guy or we see the image that is bigger and right side up. We've seen smaller and upside, right side, or and upside down. We've seen same size and upside down. We've seen bigger and upside down. All three cases so far upside down. And then we've seen, of course, no image. Let's try this one. Okay, see if we get what we saw in that first picture that we saw at the beginning of this lesson. First ray, parallel to the principal axis from the top of the object. It's going to reflect down through the focal point. The second ray, 
I would like to draw that through the focal point, but it's a little bit tricky here. So I'm going to draw the second ray as I did my second ray in the last diagram. And that's from the top of the object as if it's going away from the center of curvature. Right? If we extended that line back, it would go through the center of curvature. Draw it away from the center of curvature. Hits the mirror. Where does it go? Back upon itself through the center of curvature. Do those two rays intersect anywhere? They do not. So, what do we got to do, Wilson? Yeah, we're going to extend them. They extend back like this. There's my image formed right there where the extensions or the dotted lines form. What are the characteristics of this guy? Larger, smaller, same size. Larger. Right side up or inverted? It's right side up. That's exactly what we saw in that first photograph, right? We saw a picture of the guy that was much, much bigger and right side up. Real or virtual? Virtual. So we saw that picture of the guy looking into the mirror to see it. He had to look into the mirror to see it. He couldn't have projected that onto a screen even if he had wanted to because of his position relative to that mirror. That make sense? Larger, virtual, upright. With the bathroom mirror, the plain, flat mirror, the image is going to be the same no matter what. It will be same size, it will be virtual, and it will be right side up. It doesn't matter where you stand. If you have a concave mirror, it does. There's five different ranges of positions where you can stand and get different characteristics of images. If we flip the page over, we should see five convex mirrors or five diverging mirrors. Now, in my diagram here, my diverging mirror, I see two dots on the right-hand side. You've got two dots on the right-hand side and two dots on the left-hand side. The first dot on the right-hand side would be the focal length of this mirror. The second dot would be the center of curvature or twice the focal length. We have a dot on the left-hand side that corresponds to the focal point and another one that corresponds to the center of curvature. But those two points are really just spacers. The focal point is really on the right-hand side, not on the left. So is the center of curvature. You can't have a center of curvature of a circle outside of the circle. It's just the same distance from the mirror as the actual center of curvature is. So it's spacer. Okay, it's basically so we can define our zones. I'm going to draw one diagram here. My diagram is going to have my object way out here, well beyond the center of curvature, well beyond twice the focal length. We're going to draw two rays. And the good news is, for these diagrams, you only ever need to draw the first two. You never have to go to that third ray. So I'm not even going to show you how to do it for this one. First one, top of the object parallel to the principal axis. Hits the mirror. Where does it go? We'll give you three options. Okay, three options. Option number one, option number two, or option number three. One, two, or three. What's it going to be? Option number three. Option number three. It can't be option number one because that ray of light can't go through the mirror. It, right, it wants to go to the focal point. But it can't go to the focal point because the mirror gets in the way. The second ray that I had drawn here, look, that looks good if it's a concave mirror. But the reality is the rays don't converge. They diverge. They spread apart, not come together. So that second ray doesn't happen either. The third ray does. That third ray hits the mirror, reflects up away from the focal point. If we extended that ray back, it would go right through the focal point. Now the second ray, pay really close attention to this one. The second ray is going to go from the top of the object down, not toward the center, not toward this part of the mirror right here that's at the very front and on the principal axis, but rather it's going to go down towards the focal point. The problem is it's not going to make it that far. It's going towards the focal point, but when it hits the mirror, it stops and changes direction. Where do you think it's going to reflect? Here, 
solve for the principal axis. Do those two rays converge anywhere? They're not, no, they're not converging anywhere here. So let's extend them. Let's make them dotted lines in behind the mirror here. The first extension goes back here to the focal point. The second extension goes back here parallel to the principal axis, because it's always an extension of the reflected ray. The intersect right there. Characteristics. Larger, smaller, same size. Smaller. The second photograph that I showed you at the beginning of the lesson today showed you know, that mirror that you see sometimes in a parking garage or that mirror that's in the corner of the hot tub at the pool in Okotoks. You always see an image that is smaller in that convex mirror. Always. What else do you notice about this? Not only it's, is it smaller, it's, it's right side up or upright. Not only is it smaller and upright, it's real or virtual. It's virtual. You can see it. Just because it's virtual doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that you have to look at the mirror to see it. You can't project it onto a screen. I'm going to ask you guys over the next 10 minutes or the next 5 minutes, however long it takes you, to finish drawing the other four ray diagrams for convex mirrors. You should start seeing a pattern pretty quickly. When you do, I think you're going to find that the characteristics all end up being smaller, upright, and virtual. In other words, for a concave mirror, it matters where the object is. For a convex mirror, it doesn't. The characteristics always end up being the same. That makes convex mirrors uh, pretty versatile because we always know the type of image that we're going to get no matter where the object is. We see these convex mirrors all over the place, right? From the parking garage that somebody mentioned to the, to the uh, hot tub at the pool that I mentioned. Where else have we seen them? We've assumed until now in all these diagrams that we've got a convex or concave mirror on both axes, right? You know, you look at, you, you, you cut off the edge of a basketball and it's convex on both the X and the Y axis, right? What if we make it convex on one axis or the other? In this case, I get this paper rolled up here where it's convex on the Y axis. Now I turn it around, it's convex on the X axis. We can have a mirror like that, right? If we have it convex on the Y axis, then what you're going to see is that the image vertically is shortened, right? Because you're going to get a smaller image vertically on the Y axis. But on the X axis, where it's flat, it's not going to be shorter. You ever go to a fun house and you, you walk in and it's like you, you look the same width, but you look really, really short? Right? Or you turn it around and you look really, really skinny, but the same height? That's exactly what we have here. It's convex on one axis or the other. Where else have we seen that? Now, some of you may, some of you may have seen this, but never actually even noticed it. Sometimes, when you go into a change room, the mirror is ever so slightly convex on the x-axis. What does that do? Vertically, nothing. It doesn't change your proportions at all vertically. What does it do horizontally? It makes you look slimmer. It makes you look skinnier, right? Hey, I should buy that dress because I look really good in that dress. I look so slim in that dress. They'll never do it. They'll never do it to the point where it's going to be perceptible, where you're going to really notice that, wait a second, something's not right here. Because then it's not, trick it's not tricking you, right? But they will do it to the point where you won't notice the convex nature of the, of the mirror and to the point where you just think you look good, not you think you look odd, skinny. Where else have you seen it? One final place. I'm not accusing every store, by the way, of doing that either, but just some of them. Where else have you seen it? Driving your car on the, on the passenger side mirror, it's slightly convex. It doesn't look like it, right? Look at that mirror. It looks pretty flat. But it isn't. It's curved, and it's convex. 
Why is it convex? Well, because when you're driving your car and you're pulling in after passing somebody, you want to see a wider range, right? You want to see more in your mirror. That's how they do that. They make it slightly convex so you can see more in the mirror. The downside to that is everything looks smaller. And that's why you see that little message in the bottom corner of it that says, object and mirror are closer than they appear. Because the image is smaller, which makes it look like the object is further, is closer, or sorry, is further away than it really is. Make sense? I know when, uh, when I was your age, from the time I was 16 to the time I was, time I was 20, I drove a delivery van, um, a dry cleaning delivery van. I worked for a dry cleaner, and I would deliver dry cleaning all over, you know, one section of Nova Scotia, and uh, and uh, the the uh, the van that I normally drove, um, it was great. Loved it. It was. Uh, I was 16 years old, drove a delivery van with no side windows, right? It's a delivery van with no side windows. Can't see at the back because you've got product in the, in the back of the vehicle. You have to learn to use your side mirrors pretty quick. I was a, an amazing parallel parker when I was 16 years old because I had to, use my side, had to learn to use my side mirrors to park in a city, you know, be, between, between two cars. Um, but the first van that I drove, the regular van that I drove, it was great. It had a really tight turning radius, so it was easier to parallel park, and the mirrors were great, and it was just, it was a really easy one to learn on for parallel parking and for passing and, and for whatever. But then every once in a while, it was in the shop. And then the one that I had to drive when it was in the shop, the spare, was a Chevy Astro van. I hated that with a passion. There's a lot of reasons I hated it, but the main reason that I hated it was because this Chevy Astro van, on the right-hand side, the passenger side mirror, didn't have a convex mirror. It was a flat mirror. Now, when I was trying to pass, it was a, it was a nightmare. I mean, parallel parking was just an absolute nightmare with this thing. You drive, even when you're passing, you're driving past somebody. What do you do when you can't see out your rearview mirror because you can't see out the back window and there is no side, side windows in the vehicle? You look in your right-hand mirror, right? The problem is when it's a flat mirror, you can only see this really tiny, narrow range behind you when it's not convex. The good news is when you saw a car in that mirror, you knew exactly how far away it was because the depth perception was perfect. But you just couldn't see very much out of it. So you had to be like kind of twisting your head around and looking at it from different angles and whatever. It was a nightmare. Try parallel parking when you can only see this narrow range behind you. Again, the positive thing about it was that depth was correct because the image was the same size as the object. The downside to it was that you couldn't see as much because it wasn't convex. All right. Draw those last four diagrams. Get the characteristics for them. You should find that they're all the same characteristics. The image is going to move around a little bit. It's going to change in size a little bit, but the characteristics will still be the same regardless of what zone it's in. Finish those up. If you have any questions, just let me know, and then we're done for today.